so good evening. It's Saturday night. I want to thank everyone for joining us for part two discussion with Barbara Boyd. And today is June 17th. So uh, I'm going to basically quickly turn it over to Barbara. I just want to say for those of you who are just joining us for this class and discussion, if you missed last week's part one with Barbara Boyd, uh, she presented on the role of lawfare, which people have been hearing about a lot, uh, the example of Carl Schmidt uh, and Nazi Germany. And we're going to take this a step further. I would say I'm really excited to hear what Barbara has to say in this discussion, because I know a lot of us have really been thinking about and presented with the idea of what does it mean that we live in a republic? You know, where does this idea of a republic come from in history going back to the role of Athens, Greece, and the battle that has ensued, and the question of, you know, what does it take in term, terms of looking at the culture that we're facing today from the standpoint of the destructive counterculture, uh, culture of evil and lawfare that seeks to take away the power of the creative powers of human beings uh, from the standpoint of what our constitution was founded on. So this, this is one thing to think about the constitution from the standpoint of thinking about a democracy versus a republic. But when it says we give you a republic if you can keep it, and this idea of the role of the citizenry in keeping that republic and the history going back to the Greek Plato, uh, Athens, the first nation states, the first republic. I'm looking forward to hearing about what Barbara has to say on this history and uh, looking at the battle today in terms of uh, what she presented last week, what was the real role in, in Nazi Germany, uh, what is some of the cultural battles that we're facing today that defies the principles of the republic and how do we restore those principles uh, at its core. So I won't speak any longer there because I want to hear what Barbara has to say about that. And then just for those who are new to the discussion, uh, you may be getting on for the first time, we'll be taking your questions and your responses afterwards. And you can, and I'll tell you how to get into the queue or how to uh, ask Barbara questions on her discussion for tonight. All right, so Barbara, let me just put you on here and we will turn it over to you. Okay. Go. All right. Um, so last week, and I hope people can just uh, access that on our YouTube channel to go over it in some depth, but I just want to uh, sort of review here uh, a little bit about the rise of fascism in Nazi Germany. Uh, and what I told people last week is much to my surprise as a student at Berkeley, I discovered that Hitler ascended to power, uh, you know, through actual legal means. Everything was completely cloaked in the robes of justice, in the robes of law. Uh, and the guy who more or less uh, served the function of justifying the rise of Hitler fully uh, in, as a legal matter uh, in full compliance with the German constitution was a character by the name of Carl Schmidt, uh, referred to ever since as the crown jurist of the Third Reich. Uh, Schmidt was actually a devotee of the fascist system imposed on Italy by Mussolini, and he really just altered uh, that condition for Germany, uh, you know, coming out of World War I and coming out of the Great Depression uh, of 1929. And both Mussolini and Hitler uh, were dictators for a creation of state largely created by financiers and oligarchy and the forms of state which they created, i.e. a fascist state, uh, is actually, if you go back and study your history in terms of Roman law, uh, the Roman empire and the subsequent uh, oligarchical empires of Venice and the British empire, uh, these are perfect expressions of imperial law. And like the ancient state of Sparta, uh, these are frozen systems meant to be unchanging, led by a dictator uh, with a people subservient and schooled 
towards what really is the highest form of slavery. Uh, that is a slavery uh, bearing the quasi-religious shackles of ideology. Mussolini said that his fascist state had three components, a dictator and an administrative state and a people emboldened and wedded to a powerful quasi-religious myth. And indeed the Italian fascist state uh, combined in one form a, a dictator, i.e. Mussolini, uh, the mythos of the church, the Catholic church in the Italian format, the mythos of other uh, you know, myths which were deliberately created, pagan myths going all the way back in history uh, and elevating the uh, you know, uh, Italian people as supermen or supermen and women uh, and corporations which literally were a part of the state as private powers instead of sitting behind everything and not appearing in the fascist state, the corporations were actually honored and were made a part of the state. Um, this was the model that Carl Schmitt adapted to Germany. And in some respects, and I want you to fill this in as we go along, uh, it very much uh, resembles that which is emerging uh, in our country today. And for that reason, I want to concentrate a little bit before I get into the uh, ancients uh, on the actual legal pro projection progression to not a very fast progression from a quasi uh, democratic state to a fascist dictatorship over the course literally of two years in Germany. I want to fill out some of the financial and cultural uh, components of that because those financial or economic considerations and those cultural components are really what led to uh, the rise of fascism rather than the legal justification, which really came after those two components will, were firmly in, in, in place. Now, if I do my sketch right, your mind, I think, will make the direct comparisons to our current situation uh, so I'm not going to just stop and make each one of them. I, I want you to think about what I'm saying as we go along and think about uh, the simple fact that Carl Schmidt has become extremely popular uh, in the United States today on both the far left, i.e. think Antifa and all of the really radical leftists, among Silicon Valley libertarians uh, and conservatives on college campuses and among the so-called intellectual class in this country. And I want you to think about that as an extremely dangerous phenomenon given our present uh, conditions. Now, we begin to, we can only begin also to confront that if we confront it directly with the great bounty bequeathed on us by our unique and very much superior founding fathers. That bounty, as Bob Ingram has argued and Chuck Park will soon argue in the class series, rests with the tradition flowing from Plato, the Renaissance, Godfrey Leibniz, has nothing to do with the Enlightenment, Locke, Hume, Hobbes, or von Hayek, as many of the people who are listening to this call may have been taught to believe. And after I go through this short description of the cultural and financier components which led to the rise of Germany, I wanna go back and situate our founders and the constitution of the United States as the grand experiment in government that it was. Uh, I'm gonna do that by discussing with you German, the German Friedrich Schiller's uh, so-called Jena addresses on universal history. And in, one of those addresses, Schiller highlighted two of the earliest lawgivers, Lycurgus and Solon, both of whom were repeatedly cited by Plato and repeatedly studied their models of state by our founding fathers. What our founders were interested in, they were completely steeped in history. And what they were looking for is 
let's take all of the models of governments which have existed throughout history, and they studied them. And let's figure out why they succeeded or why they failed. And they played, they, they paid, you know, particular attention to the earliest formations of republics or states, uh, which are found in the Greek city-states of Athens and Sparta, which was why Schiller was also extremely fascinated uh, by those two models. Uh, Lycurgus, like Carl Schmitt, sought to create, in essence, a perfect war machine. Solon, Solon, on the other hand, sought to create a state which would nourish and develop the divine gift of creativity found in every individual human being. Solon's intent in his laws was to fulfill what later became known in Genesis as the great injunction for mankind, go forth, multiply, and subdue the earth. In that respect, Solon is one of the true founders of our republic. So the first part of my piece here tonight, I, I'd like to title, Fascism is not a social phenomenon, <laughs> as many people have described it throughout history. It is a determined phenomenon, and I'm about to tell you uh, exactly how it came about uh, during one period of European history, that is the so-called interwar period between the end of World War I in 1990 and the imposition of fascism in Germany uh, in 1933. Uh, in between there, uh, we have the also the rise of fascism in Italy, uh, which started out literally as socialism, uh, and then through Mussolini's, uh, you know, conversion, if you will, to something which the bankers found far more useful uh, into the actual Italian fascist state. Both the German Nazi fascism and the Mussolini corporatist form of fascism could not have existed without the firm financial and ideological backing of London, the British Empire, and its snookered Tories here on Wall Street in the United States. And I'll get into that just briefly here. Now, culturally, what was going on throughout Europe was the brutal legacy of World War I, which was a genocidal war of attrition and trench warfare, the most brutal kind of warfare leaving those who participated in it in a form of psychological shock, very similar to what is now going on in Ukraine. And out of that war came a crushing cultural pessimism uh, in Europe, accompanied by the wildest forms of hedonism and social anarchy uh, in Germany's Weimar Republic, uh, which was established right after the war. In Germany itself, the proud classical tradition of Kuza, Leibniz, Schiller, Mozart, Mendelssohn, Brahms, and Beethoven was nowhere to be found anymore. It was replaced in music by the frenetic romanticism of Liszt and Wagner. It was replaced in philosophy by the pure destructiveness of existentialism, existentialism and Nietzsche, killing God. Abstract Impressionism and Expressionism came to the fore in art. Uh, and more or less all of this represented the emotional edict running loose in the population. Let your emotions run wild, live for the moment, get drunk with sex, money, and drugs. If that reminds you of our situation now, it, it's a very deliberate analogy and a true one. It's also really not that much unlike what confronted both Lycurgus and Solon in their efforts to create a state uh, in both the situation of Sparta uh, and the situation of Athens from what were the most primitive and bestial cultural conditions uh, existing among human beings at the time. 
The Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, was negotiated by the British, the French, the Italians, the victors, and Woodrow Wilson, a really a Anglophilic uh, traitor to the United States. Uh, Congress refused to ratify the treaty. That's how bad it was. And it held Germany totally responsible for the war. It forced billions of dollars in reparations upon the German state. It enforced its total demilitarization, its total humiliation, and set about to totally deindustrialize and loot the country as the price of peace. The inability of the German state to pay that debt had a direct role in the 1929 worldwide, worldwide crash. What was envisioned as the looting of Germany by financiers in England and Manhattan, uh, and that's what they intended, was just to loot the place, was similar in scope and effect to what occurred in Russia and the East Bloc following the fall of the Soviet Union. What these financiers had in mind was first the looting of Germany and second, turning that nation into a marcher lord, uh, similar to what I will say about Sparta, uh, to be deployed by the oligarchy to, dism to dismember Russia. In other words, Hitler, as most people know, was supposed to attack Russia primarily and was never supposed to turn around and attack England kind of a big mistake by these all-powerful elitists. The reason why England and the British Empire has been fascinated with Russia since time immemorial is because within that huge landmass is perhaps the largest store of raw materials necessary to run any modern economy anywhere in the world. Now, in my sketch, the key person acting within Germany was not really even Adolf Hitler or anybody tried at Nuremberg. It was a man by the name of Hadzmar Schacht who controlled at various points the German central bank. He resigned during the interlude at one point. And when Hitler came to power, Schacht was again handed the keys to the Reichsbank, the central bank of Germany. Schacht was born in Brooklyn. I'll leave that for emphasis there. He was a lifelong asset of the Morgan financier family. Uh, and he was directly controlled in his various exertions in Germany in the interwar period, all of which were damaging and aimed at looting the German state by the head of the Bank of England, a character by the name of Montagu Norman. It was the Harriman and Morgan interests in the US combined with the industrial circles in Germany, which they controlled, assisted by the British intelligence services and the avowedly Satanist, Martinist, banker, religious cult operating out of France known as the Synarchists, who financed the rise of Hitler and Mussolini, oversaw their fascist coups, and basically invented many of the myths which uh, were endowed the people of those states with what the people came to believe were superhuman qualities. Famously, all of Henry Luce's publications right here in the United States and the venerable New York Times celebrated both the rise of Hitler and Mussolini. U.S. intelligence, which was much smarter back then uh, in the State Department and the Army, uh, was on top of this rise uh, and the various synthetic political cults, uh, which were actually created as ideologies for fascism by the synarchists and British intelligence. Our intelligence community labeled these cults correctly as Nazi-communist. Think about that. Uh, through Failed transitional regimes in the wake of World War I and under Versailles, Germany was looted, the population was immiserated, the culture was crushed and left seething with rage, ready to strike out in favor of any heroic myth, elevating their spirits and lifting their condition. The Nazi party and its racial and national myths did just that. 
Now, the British Spahn Nazi Party was the populist and controlled response, really, to the rape of the nation. There were both major socialist and fascist factions in the Nazi Party. The socialist faction was led by a guy by the name of Gregor Strausser. The fascist faction was led by Hitler. They competed for popularity with the population and for who the financiers would ultimately back. As I noted last week, there was an alternative to this path proposed by the politician Kurt von Schleicher and by Dr. Wilhelm Lautenbuch of the Friedrich List Society in Germany. They fought for American methods to solve the German depression, including a national bank, uh, the credit bank for Peter Osprauer, to directly finance pr production again, modeled on the operations deliberately of the first and second national banks of the United States. Schacht and his Anglo-American financiers and propagandists labeled the Lautenbach plan Bolshevik and campaigned as pragmatic problem solvers in the center party controlled by Hatzmar Schacht, the German and American and English bankers and their German industrial clients. Schmidt first served as the lawyer justifying brutal austerity conditions imposed on the population uh, by the short-lived Moeller and von Papen regimes from 1928 through 1932. He argued that given the economic situation, a state of emergency existed, justifying full suspension of laws and constitutional guarantees, which previously supported the public welfare and stood against the brutal suppression of wages and curtailment of social services put into place by the Moeller and von Papen regimes. Article 48 of the German constitution justified the unchecked use of emergency powers. And that was the instrument which Schmidt actually uh, you know, used to uh, bring about his desired result, his desired legal result. At the same time, Schmidt relentlessly waged an extremely effective populist attack on the German parliament and the Weimar Liberal Republic as nothing more than sock puppets for various financial interests who controlled them. And he went after the parliament, parliament as lacking any form of higher virtue. His critiques were largely true. Over the course of these four years, Support for the Nazis surged and then waned. Similarly, the Social Democrats, who had held massive power, were discredited. Von Schleicher campaigned for the Lautenbach plan frantically to save the country, but he lost. He was ousted on January 28, 1933, and Hitler was appointed chancellor in a very legal process following a surge of electoral support for the Nazis electoral support, which was bought and paid for by New York, London, and their German clients after the party was completely broke, the Nazi party, and broken less than three months before Hitler's ascent. Both Schmidt and his fellow Satan, Satanic existentialist and political opportunist friend, Martin Heidegger, joined the, the Nazi party on the same day in 1933. On February 27th, the German parliament building was attacked and burned. Schmidt and the Nazis created the myth that that was done by the Bolsheviks. It was actually a false flag done by the Nazis. And then right after that, rather than a short-lived uh, temporary dictatorship uh, was instituted rule by emergency decree on a somewhat permanent basis. If your mind is following me, all resemblance here to January 6th and the emergency measures, which we just enjoyed contrary to our constitution through COVID is I'm sure purely accidental. Schmidt justified both the former commissarial or temporary dictatorship based on Roman law, the law of the Roman Empire. 
His rise in Nazi circles was sponsored by Hermann Goring and Hans Frank. The expulsion of Jews and book burnings began soon after. By November 1933, a plebiscite was held concerning Hitler's measures and the legitimacy of his rule. And by that time, in November of 1933, remember Hitler took office only on January 28, 1933, 96% of the population approved of the dictatorship, which was actually improving economic conditions at that point. The summer of 1934 saw the night of the long knives, the assassination of every opponent of the regime, the death of Hindenburg, who was then the German president, and Hitler becoming the Fuhrer, the permanent dictator. Again, uh, the model here, which Schmidt talked about, is a three-pronged model for a state of leader or Fuhrer, an administrative or corporate state actually implementing the laws right under him, uh, empowered by the integration of private corporations, and something called movement, or in Mussolini's model, a population which had been completely brainwashed uh, to believe uh, in the myths and propaganda propagated by the regime. Now, Carl Schmidt, as I emphasized last week, said, if men and women are not evil, then my state is evil. But since men and women are evil, my state is good. Our founders, by contrast, believe that men and women are made in the image of God and participate fully in his creation and ask themselves the question, how do we shape a government based on this conception of human beings? That involves a constant and variable interplay between culture, morality, and laws, public and private spheres, free will and necessity, the necessity of natural law, the necessity of, natural, of, of national mission. Creative human beings in exercising their creativity require the freedom to play, freely to play, to experiment. But their morality has to be based on a larger mission, a mission to better all of humanity and the next generation. What our founders actually call, called in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, our first colony here in the United States, the freedom to do good. Now, next phase of this presentation, after having you know thoroughly educated you in the horror of how fascism comes into being, is entitled Our Founders and the Greeks, Lycurgus and Salome, Oligarchy versus a Republic. Now, last week, we led our discussion with books one and two of the Republic of Plato, uh, whose influence on our founders was profound, particularly those educated at Columbia College in New York, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, Governor Morris, Robert Livingston. In book one, uh, Socrates is confronted by Thrasymachus, who insists that Justice is just a figment in its ideal form. And those who have power control everything, no matter what happens. And there's really no such thing in that sense as real justice, simply the exercise of political power uh, under various formats. In book two of the Republic, Glaucon and Socrates clearly uh, unsatisfied with the dis discussion and confrontation with Thrasymachus in book one, start searching for the actual, what they call the actual essence of justice. And the first opening of that dialogue says, comes with their agreement uh, that the greatest injustice is done by those who use the cloak of justice to do grave injustice. And last week, I emphasized that that is indeed our current lawfare landscape 
in this republic, in this failing republic, as President Trump has emphasized. In their effort to find and illuminate the essence of justice, what it is directly rather than, than what is found by examining its effects, Socrates proposes to build out a city and the rest of the Republic is consumed by a series of thought experiments in which Socrates and his friends imagine various formats for a perfect state. A series of thought experiments encompassing prior forms of governments and why they work and why they fail. Precisely the preoccupation of our founders in their study of all of political history. Now, our founders really were, uh, you know, absolute students of history, something you won't find in our population now, something which we actually have to reinstill if we're going to save this republic. Uh, our constitution is, is meant to, as, you know, Sloan set out, and as I'll show you, Schiller set out, to basically create a state whose purpose is fostering the God-given creativity of each individual citizen, both citizens in the present and citizens in our posterity who come after us. That is what's stated in the preamble. If you want to think, think about how concretely involved our founders were with history, just take a look at the left portico of the Supreme Court, which illustrates my point. Uh, the right portico of the Supreme Court is fairly famous for its saying equal justice under the law. The left portico of the Supreme Court features three lawgivers, Solon, Moses, and Confucius, each of whom, as the architect noted, uh, was uh, essentially the lawgivers for uh, their respective civilizations. And I think Keisha has a picture of that that she can show us right now. Similarly, think about the Federalist Papers and the pseudonyms, if you've ever read, read the Federalist pe Papers, used by Hamilton, Madison, Jay in writing the Federalist Papers. Every one of these pseudonyms, pseudonyms Publius, etc., comes from a deep study of Plutarch and other ancient histories of Greece and Rome, which every founder of our country and virtually the entire population had been immersed in uh, for eighth grade and ninth grade students, as well as entry into college, you had to master Greek and Latin, and you had to know the histories of those respective republics. So these studies, which I'm going to illustrate, uh, you know, form the, the background uh, which actually led our founders to the constitutional debates which they had, these deep historical backgrounds. Now, one of the keenest students of our republic was the German poet Friedrich Schiller, known throughout the world as the poet of freedom. He was born in 1759. He was a lover of the American Revolution. He honored our Declaration of Independence in his famous Rootley Oath from the drama he composed called Wilhelm Tell, uh, universally acclaimed throughout the world as being a drama which actually sought to spread the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and the uh, Constitution of the, of the United States. It begins, and just think of the Declaration of Independence as you hear me read this, no, there is a limit to the tyrant's power. When the oppressed can find no justice, when the burden grows unbearable, he reaches with hopeful courage up into the heavens and seizes hither his eternal rights, which hang above inalienable and indestructible as stars themselves. 
The ideas of friends and admirers of Friedrich Schiller here in the United States helped elect Abraham Lincoln and to a large degree helped to win the Civil War for the anti-slavery forces. Very early on, the networks of Friedrich Schiller overlapped the anti-slavery networks. Uh, one example is Carl Follen, who fought in the liberation wars in Europe and emigrated to the United States in 1824 after the, the restoration of the European oligarchy following the Congress of Vienna. He was a professor of German at Harvard University in 1825 and lectured extensively on Schiller. He created much interest in Schiller, especially through his lecture series on Schiller's life and drama during the winter of 1832-33. He was kicked out of Harvard in 1835 after he drafted an anti-slavery address to the people of the United States. The famous former slave and leading spokesman for the rights of African-Americans, Friedrich Douglass, in his paper, North Star, called Friedrich Schiller the poet of freedom and quote, one of us. The efforts in the United States to celebrate Schiller's 100th birthday in 1859 were the largest the world had ever seen. They might have been bigger than the celebrations even in Germany. They were a rallying point to defend the United States against our enemies by helping to elect Abraham Lincoln. The 1859 festivities were used to arouse the spirit of the American public to defend their own constitution against the British subversion, which had culminated in the secession movement of the Southern states. More than 250,000 German Americans fought successfully on the side of Lincoln during the Civil War, and many of Lincoln's general staff were of German origin. Schiller was equally an, an admirer and lover of our revolution and a critic of the horrendous French Revolution, which followed. He noted amidst that catastrophe that, quote, a great moment has found a small people. So his essay on Lycurgus and Solon, Solon em employs his skill as a poet to sketch two very different modes of constitutions and states, that of Sparta and that of Athens under Solon. And indeed, by comparing his sketches, we can see the difference between all forms of oligarchy and the freedom to do good embraced by our founders in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. As Schiller notes, Lycurgus, when he came to write the laws of Sparta, came upon a completely horrendous state of political disintegration. Two kings ruled in competition in the city-state, creating a super polarized situation. Each of them courted the population by bribing them with greater and greater freedoms until a state of anarchy ensued. Wild democracy and then authoritarian monarchy occurred in sequence, in cycles. There was no demarcation between people's rights and the rights of kings. Under these primitive conditions, wealth flowed to the richest who tyrannized the poor and the poor's de desperation led to repeated insurrections. This is indeed the primitive state of nature envisaged by Thrasymachus in the Republic. To prevent this continuous democracy monarchy cycle what happened, what, what Lycurgus did first was to instill a third power beside the kings and the people, a Senate, to mediate between the two. His idea was if kings abused their this authority, the Senate had to side with the people and vice versa. When the people abused their authority, the Senate had to, to, had to uh, you know, basically uh, side with the kings. But then, as Schiller points out, what Lycurgus hadn't figured out or allowed for was the Senate itself becoming corrupt. That resulted in Lycurgus's successors having to int introduce yet another body called the ephors to check the power of the Senate. 
that reform was followed by a still more fundamental one by Solon. He basically confronted a situation of total income inequality, uh, very similar to the vast and yawning inequality between the rich and the poor now occurring in our country. And to actually equalize everything, he did precisely that. He distributed all the land equally among all the people. To disempower the very rich and to disempower the culture of the very rich, he outlawed all gold and silver coins and the trade in them, substituting iron instead and, very, and gave that iron a very low value at that and made it large and heavy and so much so that it could not easily be stored. To make matters even worse, he tempered that iron with vinegar. So no value uh, was you know, basically in the medium of exchange except for barter. He outlawed all luxury goods as a result of that foreign trade collapse and to imbue the citizens with a public personage and a public purpose, everyone had to eat at a public place with one another and eat prescribed meals, which were designed essentially uh, like uh, the, I assume like the kind of bug diet, which the World Economic Forum is now seeking to impose on us to be super healthy, but super austere. And in return for the meals, you contributed what funds you had uh, to actually buy them. He basically discouraged all excesses of fashion, all excesses of gluttony, all excesses of sex, all excesses of everything else, uh, and instead concentrated on education of the young as the first priority of the state and creating in turn a healthy generation to come after uh, one generation after another. To keep the love between a man and a woman fresh and healthy, they weren't allowed necessarily to see each other very much. And to see uh, his bride uh, in the first years of marriage, the groom had to actually kidnap her and was only allowed to visit her uh, at nighttime. Children belonged to the state. If well-formed and strong, strong uh, they went to a nurse. If they were weak, they were killed. They were raised as warriors for the state and everyone participated in celebrating their academic and athletic achievements. Deceits and intrigues were introduced into their curricula because they were part of the training for war. And war was the only entertainment really allowed in this very austere uh, republic. Slaves took care of the physical production of the economy in order to allow the population to concentrate their total attention on the affairs of state. Slaves were made to play out various sins like gluttony, drunkenness, to sing obscene songs and to actually kill slaves in hunger game types of attacks carried out by the young people at night as part of their upbringing. Everything in the state involved the training of the youth in games and in schooling. Lust for glory therefore became an incessant spur feeding the national spirit. The idea of the fatherland became the life of the citizen. This was the intent and the prescription copied by Carl Schmitt, Hitler, and Mussolini. That's why you find in Schmidt the idea that the ability to distinguish between friend and enemy is the essence of state sovereignty and the legitimacy of any, any leader. <clears throat> it's, it's basically a state modeled on Sparta. Schiller says, Lycurgus succeeded in his intention, which was to create a state isolated from all others, self-sufficient and capable of sustaining itself through its own internal metabolism and vital power. But love of fatherland was the one virtue featured. In other words, he created 
a warrior state, not unlike the kind of ideology uh, you know, popularized by various survivalist groups and populists right now in the United States. Everything which captivates the human soul and, and, and inflames passion was banned. Only in the womb of the state would Spartan find employment, amusement, honor, reward. This created a complete poverty of mind, as Schiller points out. While successful or merciless in battle, no innovation, no creativity, no discoveries in science and art left the population very much as Lycurus found them, unimproved, incapable of change. This republic, the Spartan Republic, as it was called, was intended to la last forever. Schiller contrasts this with what he says, and I quote, a tender mother is more beautiful than a heroic hermaphroditic creature spurning natural emotions for an artificial duty. People in Sparta became means, not ends. Foundations of natural law and morality were torn apart by law. Lycurgus's reforms held the minds of the Spartans fast where he had found them, there was no progress. Where progress of the mind, says Schiller, reflecting our founders, should be the purpose of the state. The work of the mind, the work of art, not chance, created Lycurgus's state it really was the first and very, very imperfect attempt of its time, which is why, Schiller says, people study Sparta and Lycurgus and why the oligarchy has replicated this form of state in the form of fascist states over and over and over again. Contrast that with the situation which Solon confronted in Athens, a very similar failed state at the point that Solon took over. He had been preceded by a guy by the name of Draco, who Schiller says was bereft of human sentiments, so much so that every crime committed warranted a death sentence, equal justice under the law. Draco justified this by saying that humans like Schmidt were capable of nothing good. Humans were evil. Schiller says Draco did not seek to prevent offenses, only to punish them. He took no care to eliminate the source of the offense, nor to improve the people. He created a static society. And when Solon took over, again, there was vast income inequality with the rich suppressing the poor. It was, Athens was a usurious, horrible society of debt slavery, selling your children to pay your debt and then yourself to get the very means of existence from the aristocracy, the rich oligarchic aristocracy, which ruled. When Solon was elected, there were two factions or put into place, there were two factions the poor wanted Lycurgus' land scheme. The rich wanted their aristocracy to remain. A third argued for some combination of the two classes. Solon was of royal lineage. His father gave all his wealth away to charity. That made Solon a merchant who traveled the world. He was also, and this was is key to what he developed, a poet. He knew joy and love. The study of wisdom, as Schiller says, in ancient Greece had not yet been separated from its political and military effects. He was a renowned soldier. Therefore, he as a person had the trust of all. They wanted him to be a monarch, but he said, no, that is a beautiful house to live in, but it has no exit. His first step in taking over was to annul all debts. And no one was allowed to borrow on his person any longer, i.e. the institution of that form of debt slavery was abolished. 
He said, however, that the rich could keep what they had. The poor were initially upset, but gradually realized the wisdom of it. The land that had been worked by slaves was now free and could be worked by citizens. He abolished the death penalty except for murder and breach of marriage. He divided the, the population after taking a census into four guilds by present wealth. Those who had 500 measures of dry and fluid goods was one guild. Those who had 300 such goods and a horse was a second guild. The third was those who had half as much or where two fortunes combined would make the sum. And the fourth was those who owned nothing and their craft work or but the, and their craft work or production was how they lived. They were the wage earners. The first three guilds could hold public office. The last one could vote in the National Assembly. All major issues were decided in the assembly and no person, no citizen, whatever their guild status could absent themselves from the assembly. It was the purest form of direct democracy. <clears throat> Solon justified this because he said the largest, the, the biggest danger to any republic is indifference to the commonweal. Everyone must be involved. Obviously, this pure democracy uh, resulted in something akin eventually to anarchy uh, and didn't work so well. So Solon created a Senate of 100 from each of the four guilds which then deliberated and created the issues which were to be presented to the assembly. There then arose a whole class of people covered extensively in Plato's Republic called the Sophists. And basically they appeared as things were argued in the assembly uh, to influence the vote of the assembly uh, towards whoever was paying them to make their arguments. They were, they were basically paid to make, as Scholler says, bad appear good and good appear bad, like our propagandists of today. As the population increased, there were 10 guilds. The Senate became 1,000 people, 500 of whom were active at any one time. And he tempered the Senate with the courts who could actually decide uh, the validity of the laws uh, referring those which the uh, courts, which were called the Aeropagus, found to be uh, lacking uh, in justice. So the laws and morality, says Schiller, in this particular state were in considerable unity. Solon's act, laws actually went a little bit beyond that and started to legislate uh, in many respects, uh, you know, morality under various rubrics. Uh, he legislated that every citizen should treat as an insult against a person, should, should, should treat any insult against any person as an insult against himself and was obliged to defend anyone insulted. No one he legislated could remain neutral in an insurrection. That was aimed at eliminating any indifference to anything going on in the public sphere. Steering too far from one reef, Schiller says, i.e. oligarchy, Solon sped too close to another, i.e. the anarchy, which is pure democracy. Schiller says, obviously, the remedy here was representative versus direct democracy. Uh, Solon actually limited his laws they, and said that they could only be enforced for 100 years, a form of term limiting. He says, laws must be the servants of education because things change, things progress. At the end of his essay, Schiller says, although Solon was vastly superior to Sparta and the laws of Lycurgus, the sort of paradoxes and tensions which exist in any republic uh, to be solved remained. The state must serve the people. Uh, you know, this, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a mean between laws and legislation 
and free morality and free discovery. Thus in Sparta, you won't find a genius, a Socrates, a Sophocles, a Plato, as <clears throat> basically Solon said, and others com commented afterwards, the tendency, however, in the direct democracy was for the citizens to be reasonable at home and absolute fools in their assembly. So Schiller says, Solon didn't completely resolve this. Plato didn't completely resolve these types of tensions. Things do change, but you have to have this type of principle, i.e. that all laws have to be designed such that they promote the individual God-given crea creativity of individual human beings, which in turn allows for human progress. Free will to do what is good because it is good, says Schiller, not because it is ordained. No civil law may command loyalty towards friends or generosity toward an enemy. That is a part of the culture you hopefully create and foster by a creative constitution and a citizenry engaged fully in a, in a culture which is of the higher sort of culture engendered at least in the initial stages of our republic by an educational system in, in which we were labeled, or most citizens who were labeled Latin farmers of the highest intellectual order. So, um, you know, if you think about Solon's poem, and he wrote all of his initial uh, constitution as a poem called the Constitution of, of Athens, he basically uh, ends it with this. This my soul commends me teach the Athenians. A bad constitution brings civic turmoil, but a good one shows well-ordering and coherence. As it puts shackles round about wrongdoing, it smooths out the rough, it checks greed, tempers hubris, and withers the fruits of reckless impulse. It takes crooked judgments and makes them straight, softens arrogant deeds, halts seditious acts, and ends the bile of grievous strife. And so under it, everything for mankind becomes whole and wise. If you know the Gospel of Luke, you will recognize part possibly of the derivation of the phrase there, the making of crooked judgments straight, which is precisely what Luke talks about when he describes John's role in preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Early Americans heard this passage from Isaiah in their King James Bible. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Today, many of these may have heard this in the masterwork by Handel, the Messiah's oratorio, the crooked shall be straight and the rough places plain. So I hope tonight that I've drawn for you the contrast between our constitution and experiment, as Franklin said, in empowering the people on a mission to do good and the freedom to do so versus what we face now emerging upon us yet again, uh, the fascism uh, and the models of the oligarchy uh, as, first man, as first manifest in our modern period uh, in both Germany and Italy and very much embodied in the next modeling of them occurring through uh, the globalist idea of globalist ideas of the world economic forum, build back better, uh, and the new imagined regime which they would like to implement. So I'll close my discussion there uh, and open it up for questions.